Hello, I'm Natasha Gutierrez. Welcome to Rappler Talk. Today we have a very timely interview with UP College of Mass Communication professor Clarissa David. Clarissa, welcome to the studio. Thank you. Thanks Happy for to be here. speaking with us, especially at a very Interesting timely, time. Yes, timely interview. Interesting time. Yes. Let's start with the, the environment right now. Mm -hmm. What are we seeing in terms of fake news and what have you seen is the most frequent form of fake news in the Philippines? One, and I talked about this in, in the, the talk earlier, one problem is that we, we talk about fake news as if this were, it was this one big bucket of content, that anything that we don't agree with must be fake. And we have to be able to make a distinction between what is information that is put out there for because of nefarious motives, put out there as political propaganda, versus information that is misinterpreted, right? Information that is out there misinterpreted or reframed or something. So by putting it all together and then sounding the alarm bells and calling for these Senate hearings, my concern is that we are opening ourselves up to a willingness to restrict free, free press and free speech. Okay. So it's a concern, yes, and it needs to be fixed. But it is not something that is worth making any sacrifices on free speech and free press. What is the most frequent type of fake news? Because you were talking about yes. different types. Yeah. Um, misinformation, disinformation, yeah. political propaganda. What have you seen as the most frequent form of fake news in the country? I haven't really looked at the numbers for what is most frequent. But I think the concern is not so much what type is most frequent, mm -hmm. but what kind of effect it's having. So the whole environment, and I think the metaphor that we've heard from a lot of the discussion around this is the information environment is polluted, right? So you don't know what's real, what's not. You don't know who's telling the truth. It says it's coming from a, a legitimate news website, but when you go, it's not the legitimate mm -hmm, news website. Mm -hmm. It's posing as one brand. Uh, so from an audience perspective, what the effect, the net effect is, I don't know what to trust anymore. Right. If I don't know what to trust, then I can't trust anybody, mm -hmm. and I can't trust anything. And that makes it difficult for people who have the real information right. to give information to people. So the problem here is that this, all of this is happening around politics, because politics is very polarizing. And the platforms are rigged to encourage a lot of polarizing content, sharing of polarizing content, because things that make us angry things that make us fearful are shared more frequently, are liked more frequently, and then people get hyped up and then they comment. Mm -hmm. So as a result, the stories get more traction on the platform. So stories that are important and yet not political, for example, Mayon Volcano, Correct. or disasters, or changes in the education system, or healthcare system, or something that's not necessarily political, you don't see it very often. Mm -hmm. So it gets drowned out. The issues themselves get drowned out in the politics. And that's problematic. Because then you have Filipinos who are consuming a lot of news, but not really learning a lot about the issues. What they're doing is they're consuming news that is highly polarizing and talks only about the political stuff. Mm -hmm. So we don't get information that is non-political, which is also the responsibility of the press to give us information about things that are not political. So fixing the environment um, is not about necessarily what is most common forms of fake news. It's really trying to figure out how do you get audiences um, the information that they're going to need to make decisions that are important to them on a daily basis. How does this affect democracy? You were talking yes. about effects on you know, what yes. we see, but how does this affect democracy as a whole? Yes. The main problem I see, there are two things, maybe two things. One is, if your population or citizenry falls into the trap of thinking that they can't trust any news mm -hmm. or any legitimate news organization, then democracy doesn't really work, right? Because if news industries are not functioning well, um, and they can't function if audiences don't trust them, then there is no link between the government and people. And people can't take government into account. They can't make government accountable. So you have an information asymmetry where government has all the information and people don't have the information. And then all the information comes directly from government and nobody vets or mm -hmm. fact checks or makes a decision on what you need to know and what you don't need to know. There are lots of things going on in government where 
you maybe don't need to know it. You know, daily bureaucratic decision making, you mm -hmm. don't need to know. But there are important things that need that that citizens need to know, and journalists and editors make that decision, and then they report truthful information. So if the citizenry doesn't have the information, then they can't vote in an informed way. They can't have informed opinions. They can't make their opinions heard on issues. That is the role that the press plays. Mm -hmm. So we have to make sure that that is working. Right? For any democracy to work, you have to have a healthy news industry. Um, and secondly, the problem is you're creating a demand for an artificial demand for restricting free press and restricting free expression. We shouldn't be encouraged to change portions of the Constitution to restrict free expression. That mm -hmm. affects all of us. It doesn't just affect the press. It affects every single person. Because every single person that posts anything on Facebook or Twitter or anywhere for that matter um, is expressing themselves. Mm -hmm. So somebody then decides that what you're saying is objectionable, you become vulnerable as a citizen. So we should, uh, these are basic rights that are protected currently. We shouldn't be, um, we shouldn't be willing to change our position on freedom of expression and freedom of the press. So that possibility, that frightening possibility yes. of changing that in the Constitution, you think how much of that was propelled or made possible by fake news? It's not just fake news. I think it's more the political environment also. Because why, I was shocked when anybody even, why was it even raised, mm -hmm. right? Why, by, by saying it, um, you're opening up a discussion about it. And then when you open up a discussion about it, you, you have to figure out how much are people going to be willing to scale back on their own rights, right? And we don't have information about what people think. Mm -hmm. That's the problem. So, but are we going to decide on this major, major change in a part of the Constitution based on what people are fa saying on Facebook? Mm -hmm. That is not a legitimate way of doing it because not everybody's on Facebook. Not everybody comments on Facebook. It shouldn't be, by any means, a barometer for public opinion. And I think that has been the problem, is that you're using social media as a barometer for public mm -hmm. opinion. And it's not. Mm -hmm. We should stop thinking that it is. Let's backtrack a bit. Yes. How did this even happen? How did we find ourselves here? I mean, the fact that we're even having to raise that and yes. reiterate the fact that social media is not a barometer of public yes. opinion. Yes, yes is unbelievable that yeah. this has happened. Yes. So where did this start? When did this begin? And I guess who's responsible? Um, I'm not sure that we, we can pinpoint who's responsible necessarily. If I had to pinpoint who's responsible, I would point to the platform uh, because of the way that they, that they distribute information and encourage commenting and et cetera. Specifically, fa specifically, specifically Facebook. Facebook, because here in the Philippines, unlike many other countries, Facebook is the biggest mm -hmm. um, player in the social media market. So the, the problem is, is that you, it's, I don't think it's productive to trace who's at fault. I think what we need to figure out is how to convince people that you can't use comment sections of news websites and blogs as a barometer for public opinion. And that's why I'm still a big believer of the surveys. Is there's, but we have to make sure that the surveys are properly done by credible agencies, etc. Uh, and that any changes that we need to do, we need to do according to correct process, right? And with transparent information. The that people go to read Facebook as if it was a barometer of public opinion is just convenience of availability. Mm -hmm. Because we do it all the time. We use our friends as a barometer for public opinion if we didn't have Facebook. We use conversations in the workplace. We use conversations with friends, what our neighbors think, etc. And then we have some kind of guess. We know more or less that it's your friends. Right? But still, you make a statistical sort of assumption in your head that if the majority of my friends propose, uh, support this, then probably the majority of the country proposes it, uh, uh, supports it also. And of course, clearly that's wrong. Yeah. It's easier to convince somebody that that's wrong. But if they see thousands and tens of thousands and millions of comments on mm -hmm. Facebook, 
it's harder to convince them that the people who are commenting there are not necessarily representative of the country. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Because it's so many. But you don't know how real those opinions are. And you don't know how real the people are behind the opinions. Uh, you know, on Twitter, specifically, there are a lot of bots. So there are technologies out there that can game the system. And the system is a commercial system. We shouldn't lose sight of the fact that Facebook is a commercial entity operating outside mm -hmm. the Philippines. Uh, why would you use it to be a barometer as a basis for, as a barometer of public opinion in the locality of your country, especially when not all Filipinos are on Facebook? Mm -hmm. So you talked about the platforms and the technology that made this possible. Yes. You talked about the dangers of political conversations drowning out other issues that matter. Yes. Can we talk a bit about how politicians have used these to further agenda? Mm -hmm. For instance, why is the government calling legitimate news outlets yes. fake news? Yes. That's not also, well, first, it's not unique to us. I think, I think someone out there had said that if you trace it back, the first person that really used the term fake news was Donald Trump. So the, 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 the intent to delegitimize legitimate news organizations and their reporting is a way to gain power. Uh, it's done in, by other countries, by other presidents, by other officials of government. It's not, an, it's not uh, by any stretch unique to the Philippines. And I mean, right, right now, today, if you read the news in the U.S., you have, I think, senators and congressmen calling out President Trump and saying that you shouldn't attack the legitimacy of the news because everybody relies on legitimate news. They don't want to admit it, but government also relies on legitimate news. If they can't trust information from somewhere, how are they going to get their own verified information? Mm -hmm. They're not going to actually run their own um, news outfit that can do all the job, the collective job that journalism in the Philippines does. Yes. So everybody's reliant on the system. So it's very dangerous to make the vast majority of people distrust all legitimate sources of information. I mean, it's fair to say that people should verify, should verify sources, mm -hmm. see do you trust this or not trust this, but as a blanket sort of statement to say that you can't trust the news, mm -hmm. if you can't trust the news, where are you going to get information if, knock on wood, a big disaster happens tomorrow? What happens when we're not talking about politics anymore? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What happens when we're talking about walang pasok? <laughs> Something benign, or you're talking about new medication that you can use for something. You know, there are all of these other things mm -hmm. that the news covers that fake news doesn't. Politicians do watch the news. They do rely on the they news, do. like you said. Yes. So by calling legitimate news organizations fake news, there is an intent to harbor distrust in media organizations. I think so. I think there is. I think either Either they have a motivation to, harbor, to create distrust among the public or, or and they distrust it themselves, right? And then they're projecting that distrust. So there's always going to be, it is part of a healthy democracy that the press will have tensions with the government. That's the way it's supposed to be. Mm -hmm. The press are not there to be the PR arm of the government. The press are there as a watchdog. So if you have news organizations that only give you good news, you know that it's not complete because that can't be the case. There has to be some bad news somewhere. Mm -hmm. And as a populist, what we do is tell us about the bad stuff because the good stuff, that's your job. You're supposed to be doing that on a regular basis, right? right? So you tell us what's happening that we need to know so that we can be aware of the things that need to be fixed. Okay. Because ultimately, public servants work for us. Okay. So now let's mix bloggers in which is something yes. that is very recent and very new and that yes. sort of influence. So yes, we give it to the audience, we say this is what's being reported on by legitimate news organizations, mm -hmm. this is what's being spread by perhaps other uh, pages. Yes. And then how about the bloggers? Yes. What role or what ecosystem have they created and how has that impacted yes. the spread of, mm -hmm. I'd like to say, misinformation or disinformation right. because the term fake news does discredit news organizations like us? Yes. So bloggers are, bloggers have been around before, since before Facebook, people were blogging. Uh, what Facebook allowed was greater reach and targeted reach. Mm -hmm. So, and they found this in the US where you have less about bloggers, but like 
fake news organizations or hyper-partisan news organizations. And here what we have are hyper-partisan bloggers on all sides. Uh, it's just that one side is better at it than the other. So the issue here with bloggers is when they themselves claim that they have better information and more truthful and objective information than legitimate news organizations. And normally, and I don't blame them for saying it mm -hmm. because everybody has to have their pitch. Mm -hmm. You know, it's mm -hmm. their, it's their, they're selling themselves. Mm -hmm. So they're trying to figure out how to get more audiences to believe them. And that's how they operate. What's troublesome is how many people believe them. And I think this is where my point is, that we as a country don't have a long history with news organizations. We don't, our newspaper readership was historically low. Um, television organizations are the big ones with large audiences, but they're not, um, their content is less political than newspapers. They have a lot of other content that's less about politics. And so they're not necessarily a big part of this debate. Uh, and, and so the rise of the bloggers is enabled largely by Facebook mm -hmm. and then legitimated by entrance into formal government mm -hmm. offices or entrance into the news organizations themselves. Some of them do. And, you know, this is tied up with also you have journalists who also blog, right? So from the point of view of somebody who's just reading all this stuff on Facebook. It's quite blurry. It's very blurry. It mm -hmm. becomes very difficult to decide. When am I believing this person? Mm -hmm. When am I not believing this person? And if I believe this person, whatever they say, do I believe regardless? Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking about it more from the view of audiences. It's from the experience of somebody who's reading their news nowhere else but Facebook. Uh, what do they see? Mm -hmm. They see a whole mix of stuff. But they see a mix that is predetermined by some algorithm mm. and by your friends and the pages that you follow. Right? So you have, you have a silo and that's everything that you see. News organizations used to be able to decide what you see. You get your newspaper at home and you get the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Even if you have no interest in reading international news, mm -hmm. you see it. You have a choice to read it. Now, if you're getting your news only on Facebook, you have no choice except what Facebook shows you. Right? So Facebook can give news organizations the power to insert content to people's feeds that they may not be interested in normally. But they don't do that. They just do everything by algorithm. Mm -hmm. um, and by doing that, what they do is if you pay them advertising dollars or mm -hmm. pesos, to push content to certain targeted subgroups. It can be done. So what happens is legitimate news organizations, which very often out of principle won't do that, mm -hmm. uh, matatalo sila mm -hmm. by propaganda machines mm -hmm. that do that on a regular basis and have no ethical bounds to not do it. You talked about ethical bounds. Yes. What then happens when the government not only gives bloggers government positions, but actually goes to them first with the information before news organizations, which is yeah. something we've seen in the past. Well, in theory, because now it seems like there's no distinction for them, for the government, whether you're a blogger or a news organization. Mm -hmm. And I don't know to what extent this is just a natural evolution of the industry. Um, you know, so it's essentially giving them a scoop that the others don't have. That's unfortunately neither illegal uh, it's not illegal. They do it all. They did it before bloggers were a thing, right? So they would give scoops to certain journalists that they have relationships with, or they give exclusive to certain papers, and that's part of what, um, let's say, a press secretary or someone is supposed to be doing for strategy purposes. Uh, it's not. It's not illegal. It's just an environment everybody has to learn how to, how to work with. What's more dangerous is when you feed legitimate news organization, organizations fake information. That is much more troublesome. So that's why the job is diffi more difficult now. Because when you have, mm -hmm. when you can't trust the people giving statements, then you have to have additional layers of fact checking. And as I said earlier, what we need to figure out is how do we get people to value the truth to begin with? To, f to be willing to go the extra step and say, is this true? Where can I check? Because right now, for audiences, there's no consequence. Mm -hmm. So you have 
audiences where it's okay whether it's true or not I like it that's I think the bigger project is how do we get and this is a project in my view for the education system um, we have to talk to students we have to talk to the next generation and, and social media and literacy social, me uh, social mm. media news literacy mm. I think news literacy as a specific sub area of mm -hmm. literacy is something that needs to be part of the conversation because news is supposed to be a core part of a democratic society for as long as we're a democratic society mm -hmm. uh, knock on wood for as long as we're democratic it always has to be here otherwise by definition we're not what's the end goal do you think of this spreading of misinformation this disinformation the bots the trolls the fake accounts what is the end game what's the end goal the, I don't I mean, this is speculation on my part. I don't think there's a big end goal. I think it's a day-to-day -day thing. This is something that we can do. Let's do this. It is something we can do. Let's do this. So it's just that there's now a platform to do it at such a large scale. Because they used to do it small scale. All governments do it small scale, right? All governments do it small scale. Past and present governments. But now there's a way to do it. Exponentially. Scale. Yes. And immediate. Mm. Um, and What's, what's troublesome is not so much that there's an intent to do it. What's troublesome is the willingness to be, it's the willingness to engage in violent speech, mm. in threats, in bullying. And I mean, I'm shocked at the kinds of comments that people are willing to say mm -hmm. online. Because what that does is you have children who are learning this kind of language from their Facebook accounts. They're, reading it on news websites, on blog posts, mm -hmm. comment sections, where you have 14, 15 year old kids who are not supposed to be on Facebook. Yeah. According to the, by the way, you know, Facebook says you're not supposed to, what's the age, 13 or something. They have an actual age where you're not supposed to be on Facebook. They're learning this behavior. Um, very early so on. Yes. Very early on. So they learn language, they learn behavior, they mm -hmm. learn the bullying, they learn the threatening mm -hmm. from Facebook, which nobody's really looking at. It's exposure to, I would argue, content that is uh, harmful to children mm -hmm. because they see violent threats. Okay. Violent threats of rape, of murder, of, you know, you don't allow it on television. Why would you allow your children to see it on Facebook? So the, there's the, there's sort of the news content that may be true or maybe not. Okay. But there's also another layer of concern, mm -hmm. which is all mm -hmm. the comments that come after and the attacks and the bullying and everybody sees that. And then it encourages a certain kind of behavior. A normalization. A normalization of violent behavior that we don't want to be normalized, regardless of political color. Mm. You shouldn't be normalizing bullying. Uh, and that's a part of the concern that I think not enough people are worried about. That's true. It's actually kind of a back conversation when we mm -hmm. talk about these things. Yes. You did mention education and the importance of that uh, in the curriculums. Mm -hmm. What else do we do? How do we solve this problem? What should Facebook be doing? And for us as citizens and as netizens, how do we fix this? It has to be many different fronts. I think education is one. So all the communication schools, there are big programs out there on media literacy. There has to be specific modules on news literacy. Uh, so literacy, media literacy is for the education system, the formal education system. Then. I think the industry has to figure out how to wean itself away from the reliance on social media for audiences. Mm -hmm. Because it's not a good position to be in mm -hmm. for anybody, to be reliant on essentially one distributor, right? And that's, a, I admit, a more difficult thing to do. Uh, and everybody's, but everybody's trying to fix this problem, mm -hmm. and even Facebook is trying to fix the problem. It took them a long time to figure out that they are part of the problem. Now they have acknowledged that they're part of the problem and they're trying to fix it. So for the platform, they need to figure out how they're going, who, what role they have to play in the news market. Are they going to continue to be a major player in news distribution? If they are, then it's important for the news industry and audiences to make it clear to Facebook what is a less dangerous way of having this platform in the news market, even dominated without making it so polar, making the politics in a country so polarized. Mm -hmm. and we're not the only ones with this problem. This problem is in many countries. Uh, and they are running experiments with algorithms on small sets, small sets, uh, sets of small countries that have impacts on civil society there, politics there, political polarization there. Why are they allowed to do that? Mm -hmm. 
when they can do real harm. So here, when we study the democratic society, what we really, it's important to have civil disagreements and debates. Yes. Emphasis on civil. Not even, there's an emphasis on rational debate. But I think the emphasis on civil, uh, mm. that we should be able to talk about politics without threatening each other. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Because if we can't, then how are we supposed to run a democracy if we can't converse about issues without screaming at mm -hmm. each other on Facebook? And that's sort of what Facebook needs to have control of, the bullying and the harassment. If they can control that and then make sure that audiences have the opportunity to see all news, regardless of political side, mm -hmm. and outside of the algorithm that's currently running Facebook, which is driven by engagement metrics, uh, then, then it can be more a force for good. So just bringing it now back to the present, mm -hmm. we saw all of these trends already. We saw this sort of behavior and these, um, I guess, toxicity from everywhere, from, from, yes. from online, from government, from, from different parties. Is what's happening now, particularly what we're facing as a news organization, did that surprise you? Is that something you foresaw? No, I can't say I foresaw it. I don't think, I think many other people foresaw it before I personally did. Uh, the, the attacks on the press have been building in many ways. And so I think part of the reason is it's very difficult for the media to defend itself because mm. where are they going to defend themselves? They will defend themselves to the public, to their own platforms. So how do you get the public the information that they need when there is building distrust? And you're constantly fighting off attacks. you're constantly fighting off attacks. So my concern with all of this is that it's also my concern with fact-checking and things like this. If the precious little time reporters and editors have is spent fending off attacks and fending off um, bullies and, and fact-checking other fake information that other people have put out there. What time do they have left mm. to actually report the news, mm -hmm. which is what we need, mm -hmm. right? So we have to be careful, the industry has to be careful not to get distracted. Of course, there are important things. So if you have uh, threats to press freedom, you have to address them. But attention of anybody is finite. So we have to make sure that we, that the industry doesn't pr prioritize, doesn't get, let itself get distracted by trying to fact check stories that are fake out there. Because that never ends, that mm -hmm. project never ends. There will always be more fake stuff mm -hmm. than there are real stuff. It takes more time to fact check a story than to write a fake story. So from that point of view, it's, yeah. hindi hindi and na it's fair, letting diba? the environment dictate. Yes, how you're going to, to deliver the news. Yeah. So I think the focus on delivering valuable good journalism is where all ener energies need to be mm -hmm. on issues that people need to know and would have an interest in. Because we need to remind the public that this is not only about politics, this is about everything else that's going on in the world. Mm -hmm. You rely on news for things that are not political. Right? So what happens now? Well, if you need to know kung pumatok na ang mayon, mm -hmm. saan ka pupunta? Mm -hmm. Hindi ka pupunta sa bloggers. <laughs> right? kung, or you go to a government site, or you go, right? You which go is, to a again, government site, which is always slower in response mm -hmm. than news organizations. But that also narrows power to only yes. the yeah. elite, or I guess, or the... Okay. Yeah. Did the surprise, uh, I mean, did the reaction surprise you of on the SEC decision? Not really. I think... I think it was surprising to the extent that it went international really quickly. Mm -hmm. But I think people knew that this, I think the reaction was appropriate. Appropriate in that we have to make sure we protect the press. We have to make sure we protect everybody's right to dissent, press or individual. Because uh, it's everybody's right and everybody should be concerned about any threats to their own personal rights. How concerned should we be? on everything that's been happening so far? Not just media, but Filipinos. How concerned should we be about this rise of fake news? Is this something that will only get worse if we don't do something about this? Is this something you think that's a trend that will eventually die out? Will technology eventually find a way to control this because of the pressure? How concerned should Filipinos be about the current landscape? 
I think, I think now that it has hit the US, um, the technology companies will do stuff, many of them. So Google is already doing something, Facebook is already doing something. So, so to some extent, and that I think is the most efficient way of doing it. The most efficient way to fix it is that the technology so platforms created it. Will, that will just turn off a switch or change a switch and then things will immediately change on your feed. Um, so that is going on and that will happen, it will change. So I'm optimistic now because the technology companies are under a lot of global pressure to change. And so when they change, and if they change correctly, uh, the problematic content, regardless of where it's coming from, could magically disappear. Right? So this whole thing is very centralized because the distribution mechanism is centralized. Mm. It's just Facebook. So without Facebook, if you imagine a world without Facebook, without Facebook, you can write as many fake stories as you want and ma as many political memes as you want. Nobody's going to see it. So distribution is not it's there. Distribution is not there. So um, from the audience side, I think there's a lot that can be done. Mm -hmm. I think increasingly the benefit of it being picked up as an issue broadly and having Senate hearings, although having a bill in a Senate hearing makes me nervous because I don't want legislation in the business of telling me what I can and cannot say. Mm -hmm. It's not something we should tolerate. But what the, the, the side effect of that that was positive is it made people alert that this is a problem. Mm -hmm. So from an individual level, I think it's important for people who are sharing information out there, um, not just for their own, but for others. Like if you're, if you're sharing something that is very obviously fake or easily verifiable, Yes, <laughs> because your friends and <laughs> because your friends are gonna see yeah. that you're sharing something yeah. that's completely untrue, mm -hmm. or you know, so you're gonna be judged for it. Mm -hmm. so you also just for the sake of also your own mm. uh, reputation, you should protect yourself from being fooled by fake news, because a lot of it is very easily debunked. Mm -hmm. Right? Some of it is very obviously fake. So pagka fake, and then and then from people who see it, I would argue you call it out. You call so it if out. a friend of yours post something that's fake, kung ayaw mo naman sila mapahiya, what you can do is just pay and then okay. tell them this is fake. And then if they don't take it down, and then you have a fight, <laughs> then bahala ka na what you want to do with that friend. Um, but it's a role that we all have to play. But it's a role that we all can play because it's also protecting your friends. Mm -hmm. You know, so ayaw mo naman mapahiya yung mga kaibigan mo na nag-share sila ng something that's obviously fake. And it's happened to me that I've shared something that I thought was a legitimate Twitter thread about Trump and um, uh, and, and other presidents on Twitter mm. and then as it turns out it was just a humorous meme and I was called out on it and then I said it in the Facebook post that it turns out is humorous and I appreciated that mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. I think that from a user end okay. is also valuable mm -hmm. because you know nakakahiyang mag-share ng fake news hindi natin yeah. dapat yung ginagawa kasi uh, if you end up encouraging your friends to share fake news then you become responsible for what they are sharing. And mm -hmm. if it's not real and they act hmm. on it, like say walang pasok. Di ba may umikot na walang pasok that turned out to be not true mm -hmm. completely. And if your friend got it from you, uh, then you Direct, become responsible for responsible, that information. Right, right. So we have to be careful about it just from personal experience. We've talked so much about the challenges and the negativity, I guess. Do you see a light at the end of the tunnel? I think so. I'm optimistic. I'm optimistic because of something I read lately that with every new technology, there's a phase like this where you have a new technology, everybody's excited, all the good stuff happens, and then all the bad stuff will happen mm -hmm. because, you know, you can't predict how people will use the technology. And so when all the bad stuff happens, the market will correct. Mm -hmm. uh, when it becomes, this is where I think Facebook eventually will be. People are going to start turning it off. So when people people are going to see if if it becomes a cesspool of hate where they're concerned that their children are going to be in a platform where they could be bullied, mm -hmm. they could have exposure to language that normally you wouldn't allow in the mm -hmm. house and mm. they'll see it on Facebook, then you just make a decision. Turn it off. Right? So if Facebook wants to keep its market dominance now, then it has to make sure that it protects its users. So I think eventually it will change. I'm also optimistic that there's pushback against the technology companies from governments around the world, not just the Philippines. Even those governments that do use it for their, yes, for their end. Yes, yes, there is there is pushback because everybody, 
even if now on Facebook you're a winner, everybody is beholden to their algorithm changes. Mm. So if you are a partisan mm -hmm. blogger now, and then and you get all your power from Facebook's reach, um, if Facebook suddenly decides that oh you you are not um, following our user policies, they can just turn you off. Mm -hmm. They mm -hmm. have all the power, you know, in all of this. He who really has all the power is Facebook. Mm. Uh, they can turn anybody off. So, regardless of whether where you are in this politically, um, everybody is reliant on Facebook for the reach, and that's something that everybody has to realize. So that's where a lot of the lobby needs to take place. Let's hope that the good comes sooner rather than later. I, then <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> Thank you so much for your okay. time, Clarissa. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. I was just speaking to a UP College Professor of Mass Communications, uh, Clarissa David, who were talking about fake news and its impact on democracy. Thank you for following.